you read a John Lee's autobiography, one of the things you notice is the extent to which he would make vows. He'd sit and meditate and have a purpose. There's a problem he wanted to have clarified or some question he had in his mind, he would pose it. So said, I want to sit here until I get this cleared up. And then he'd drop the question and go into concentration. And as his practice developed, the questions he would ask himself and things he wanted to know would get more and more refined. So you might find it a useful practice as you meditate. Ask yourself, what am I here for? There's got to be a purpose to what you're doing. Sometimes we hear that meditation is all about having no agendas and not trying to change anything at all. But I've never seen the Buddha describe it that way. You've got to have a purpose. Think about the Four Noble Truths. Where in the Four Noble Truths is your purpose today? When you see the Buddha's definition of ignorance, it doesn't mean having preconceived notions. It doesn't mean trying to change things. Ignorance means not seeing things in terms of the Four Noble Truths. For most of us, that describes the state of our mind. We're thinking about other issues, other problems. usually based around your sense of who you are and what you need to keep who you are going, or the people you love, the relationships you love, to keep them going as well. Those kinds of issues, those kinds of questions, the Buddha said, are ignorance, viewed from the point of view of trying to put an end to suffering. So even though you may have responsibilities in the world, for, at least for the time being, put them aside. The mind will be a lot stronger if you can. And you also find that there are areas within you where you're creating a lot of unnecessary suffering. And that suffering is weighing you down. And when you're weighed down, you're less able to deal with your responsibilities. So putting the issues of the world aside is not an irresponsible thing. That's one of your first agendas. It's written into the basic refrain for right mindfulness, sub subduing greed and distress with reference to the world. All the issues you have about what you want about the world or how you're upset in the world, you just want to put those aside. Put those aside. They come up in the mind, you put them aside. I've been reading different books on mindfulness, and one of the strangest things I found is one book where the author says, well, the Buddha tells you never to interfere with anything, or he doesn't tell you to interfere with anything that's happening in the mind. But there it is, right in the basic formula, putting aside greed and distress, or subduing greed and distress with reference to the world. That means that anything that gets in the way of your seeing things simply in terms of the Four Noble Truths, you've got to put that aside. And that takes a lot of effort right there. Sometimes the effort requires a lot of ingenuity on your part, and sometimes it's just a matter of watching things, allowing them to subside on their own. This is an individual matter. But even just watching things has an agenda. You're doing it because you want to understand them, or you found that that's the most effective way of dealing with that particular problem, that particular distraction. Because we are here to figure out why we're creating unnecessary suffering and what we can do about it. Part of what we can do about it, of course, is to develop the path. This is why we're working on specifically on the factors of right effort, right mindfulness, and right concentration. They all go together. And you're trying to inform this with right view. So those are the factors we've got going. And the right view, of course, has that agenda. You want to comprehend suffering so you can put an end to it. So how does that relate to the breath? Well, you do want to develop right effort, right mindfulness, right concentration. How are you going to get the mind to stay settled down with the breath? That's the effort right now. 
you keep the breath in mind. And regardless of whatever else comes up, you try to relate it to the breath. Feelings come up and you relate them to the breath. How, do the, how does this feeling relate to the breath? Is it caused by the way you're breathing or is it completely irrelevant? Say there's a pain someplace in the body. How does that relate to the breath? Go experiment a bit. Change the way you breathe. See if that changes the pain. Breathe around the pain. Breathe through the pain. Change the way you could think about the pain, and then see what that does to the way you breathe in reference to the pain. There are lots of ways to experiment. And if nothing seems to work, then you just allow the pain to be there and work with other issues in the body, trying to create a sense of well-being someplace else. The Buddha talks about as soon as you get sensitive to what long breathing feels like and what short breathing feels like, then you try to expand your awareness to fill the whole body. And then look out for what he calls bodily fabrication. This is the intentional element that goes into the in and out breath. It's just to calm it down. How do you calm it? You're trying to make things more comfortable. So the breath feels less laborious. So the body feels at ease. You can change the rhythm of the way you breathe. You can make it deeper, more shallow, heavier, lighter, faster, slower. You can think of breathing in different parts of the body. If you notice that one set of muscles seems to be doing all the work. Give that set of muscles a holiday. Say, okay, for the next few minutes you don't have to do any breathing work at all. And see how the rest of the body responds. Other parts of the body, other muscles will pitch in. They'll do the breathing work for a bit. You can also change the way you think about the breath and perceive it. Sometimes when we think of getting the breath energy to come through the body, we're trying to push it through the parts of the body that are sensations in the body that are already there. And sometimes that creates a friction, a sense of discomfort. Change the perception. Try to think of the in and out breath just simply filling up the parts of the body that are there without having to run through them. It kind of suffuses through the body with a minimum amount of friction, minimum amount of pushing or pulling. See how that perception changes your sensation, the, the extent to which the, your sense of the body is being fabricated by the way you breathe. So lots of things to play with here, lots of things to adjust, lots of issues you can ask yourself around the breath. When the mind has trouble settling down, is it because of the way you breathe or is it because of the way you perceive the breath? If you perceive the breath as a more subtle energy suffusing the body, then all the breath channels in the body are connected out to every pore. Just hold that perception in mind and see how the body responds. And if you find a sensation that feels really good, what can you do to maintain it? You can't clamp down on it because that will spoil it. It's like seeing a beautiful bubble, and you want to catch the bubble, of course, but in the act of catching it, you destroy the bubble. But suppose the only thing that's going to cause the bubble to break is the wind. Well, you can cup your hands around it, protect it. And you do the same thing with a really comfortable sensation in the body, especially one that comes by changing the way you breathe. How can you maintain that perception? How can you maintain that lightness of touch? As John Voor once said, there are basically three stages to the meditation. One is learning how to do it. The second, once you've done it, then how do you maintain it? You don't want to just have one little flash of quiet. Mm. 
and the quiet is there, how do you relax around it? So that it stays without your trying to grab hold of it. Remember, grabbing hold is not the way that things like this are maintained. There was a woman one time in Thailand who was meditating on the hill and happened to be watching her meditate. And all of a sudden she reached out tried to grab something, fell over, then looked around to see if anybody was watching. She looked very embarrassed. She told me later she'd had this vision of a golden tray floating in front of her. And her instinct was to grab it. Of course, that destroyed the vision. So when you find something that's really nice, how do you maintain it? How do you relax around it? How do you give it space? How do you protect it without bursting the bubble? That's an important skill right there. So if you've been observing your meditation, ask yourself, well, what, what do I need? What do I need clarified? If it's some issue outside of your meditation, you do like a John Lee. You pose the question in your mind, and then you just drop it and get into concentration to see if the stillness of the mind would yield an answer. If it has something more to do with specifically what you're doing right here, right now, it's a different issue. You're watching and you're experimenting and looking at what happens as a result. And if nothing seems to be happening or can't figure anything else, you just sit and watch for a bit. See what you can observe. See if there's anything unexpected that you may notice. So sometimes some meditation involves experimenting and changing this and changing that. And sometimes the experiment is just sitting and watching. But either way, there's a purpose. And whether you make a formal vow about trying to figure something out, trying to figure something out in the course of the meditation. Or simply pose a question in your mind and start poking around and exploring. Always remember there is a purpose for being here. We're trying to comprehend suffering to the point where we can abandon its cause. And the way we do that is developing the factors of the path. That's the framework for everything we're doing. So I try to keep that larger framework in mind. Anything that gets in the way or obscures that, you try to, as the Buddha said, you try to subdue it. And that's how you keep on track.